Hey guys, welcome back to my quarantine vlog. This is Carol Vlong One, week five. Make sure you subscribe below. Um, we're gonna do a little cooking show for you this week with me and Alan. So let's go get our little pal, all right? Alan, come in, it's time for dinner. Okay, just so you guys know, between you and I, Alan's not listening. I sent him the recipe last night, so hopefully he knows what to do. If he doesn't, there's gonna be consequences. Okay, hi Alan, nice to see you. So as you can see, I'm boiling water. We're gonna make some tortellinis with pesto and some cheese. If you know anything about me, friends, I love cheese. Ask any of my roommates, I will eat grated cheese just on a plate, and it's so good. Alan, I said not cubed potatoes, I said strips. Ugh. It's fine, it's fine. They'll do. So we put the cubed potatoes in the water. Ouch. And then they start to cook. Anyway, this was fun. Alan's not my favorite right now. We're in a fight now. Um, I love you guys and come back next week for week six. <laughs> What up Westwood students? Welcome to HSM and I'm really excited to see ya. If you're an MSM, you're in the wrong place. So get out of this here video and go over to our MSM video. They're two separate things now. We love you though. Have a great time over yonder. Uh, this week, Matt Velasco is going to be talking on the third week of our Behind the Curtain series. He's going to be talking on Romans 8. Super pumped. Oh, I'm Caroline Blumberg. I'm the high school and college ministry intern at Westwood. Nice to meet you. Hi. It's good to see your beautiful faces. If you're not already following us on Instagram, friends, you should follow us on Instagram at westwood.students. Matt will put it right there. Westwood.students. Uh, for updates on what's coming up, uh, funny videos, uh, ways to get involved, and other stuff like that, you should follow us on Insta. Um, on Thursday night is going to be our second live worship and prayer night at 7 p.m. on Thursday night on the whole Westwood Community Church uh, Instagram and Facebook page. Uh, me and my roommates did it this last week for the first one. And we just put it on the TV, and we were just worshiping in our living room. I was on the floor, Jill was on the couch, Carly was standing, and it was really, really awesome. I was super impressed, and you guys should join us, 7 p.m. this Thursday. Um, something really cool happened this weekend. Um, on Saturday, we did the food drive, the HSM, or student takeover of the Bless From Home initiative, and it went so well. You guys, we almost got 2,000 pounds of food just from you guys, which is just amazing. Uh, we're really loving our community well, and I'm so proud of you guys, and it was so fun to see your faces. But we got a little recap video for you to watch. I got this feeling inside my bones. It goes electric, wavy when I turn it on. All from my city, all from my home. We're flying up, no ceiling when we in our zone. I got that sunshine in my pocket. Got that good soul in my feet. I feel that hot blood in my body when it drops. Ooh, I can't take my eyes off of it. Moving so phenomenally. You more like the way we rock it. So don't stop. Shouldn't do, but you dance, 
Well, that's how it went. And it was so, so, so fun. I was in my Yoshi costume and with a blow horn, just screaming at people. And it was a blast. Um, now we're gonna go on to the next thing, which is the student spotlight, which is basically we asked a student in HSM, what have you been doing during quarantine and how have you been seeking God um, in quarantine? So we're gonna hear from a student now. Hi you guys. Um, first of all, I miss you guys a lot and I miss HSM. I miss Jan Small Group. Shout out to you guys because y'all are my favorite. Overall, I'm just missing my time at Westwood and my time elsewhere that's not in my room with my sister 24-7. <laughs> Basically, what I've been doing during this quarantine time is obviously online school. Um, we have online dance classes through the Dance Warehouse now, so I'm still having practice. But then also what I did was a few weeks ago, I put on my Instagram story, like slide up if you want a little bit of love in your mailboxes. And I've been writing letters to either people that I do know, people that I've distanced with, and people that I don't know at all, like I've never have even met. Basically just writing them letters of hope and trying to spread the love of Christ to people that don't know, writing people that Jesus loves them. It's been really fun. Um, it's a lot. <laughs> I think I have like 50 letters to write still. They're coming, slowly but surely, but they're coming. <laughs> it's just been a lot, and especially with all the workload coming in. But uh, that's what I've been doing during quarantine. But then something that God's taught me is that during this time, it's really easy to look at all the things that we don't have. Like, I wish my body looked like this. I wish I was prettier. I wish I had better clothes. I wish I could be at school. I wish I could be with my friends. I miss dance. It's really easy to dwell on the things that we don't have during this time. And it's really easy to forget what we do have right now. So basically what God's been teaching me is that Jesus died on the cross for us to live in imperfection. So it's so totally okay to be imperfect because that's how he designed us to be. You are individually handcrafted by God and like how your life goes and everything that you have is exactly who he wants you to be. It's just been many weeks of reflection and just learning to love the things that Jesus gave me in my life. Just becoming to be thankful for the things that I didn't really give thanks to beforehand. Um, so yeah, that's what I've learned and that's what I've been up to. <laughs> um, and yeah, so let's get on with the lesson. Well, thank you for sharing. I love hearing about how you guys are seeking God in new and creative ways, how you're keeping in community, how you're staying in the word. Um, we can always, always be seeking God, no matter what circumstance we're in. And so I love hearing your stories. Keep them coming. Um, we love you guys. And now we're going to go into a time of worship with our man, David. Um, and it's going to be rocking. So sit down, stand up, get comfortable, and let's worship God together. Hey guys, my name is David. I'm so excited to be with you guys tonight. Um, I think we're going to have a pretty fun one together. Uh, you know, during this quarantine, it's been a little stir crazy at my house. I've got uh, two small babies, 22 and 9 months old. Um, and they are, uh, their favorite thing right now is to play with the chickens that we just got. And so, um, I've been busy building a coop been uh, getting things ready for them. They're finally old enough to move out of the house. Um, their names are Tina, Megan, uh, Donna, Betty, and Karen. Um, so they're doing well. We're doing well, my wife, my kids, and I. Um, but I wanted to share this song with you guys. It's called Oh Come to the Altar. I think it's important for us as a community to come together um, and collectively lay our burdens down. Uh, and give them to Jesus because he's calling, he's waiting for us, um, and he is the one who makes our burdens light. So friends, um, sing together if you want, or just take in the words. But here we go. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? 
Do ye thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and train them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born. God, we thank you so much for tonight. We thank you that we can come together in these crazy times and sing your praises. Lord, we ask that you would bless this time we have with, with you and with each other tonight, that we would feel a sense of community around us. We thank you so much for all that you're doing. In your son's name we pray. Amen. What's up, guys? Uh, open up your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. We are going to get started right away. As per usual, we are going to be starting in, in verse 31. In verse 31, we are wrapping up this section of the Behind the Curtains series. The series will continue into next week, but we are going to be going behind the curtains of another area of Scripture. You'll have to tune in next week to see what we are doing. I can promise you it's going to be amazing. 
uh, because we're going to be reading God's Word. And God's Word is indeed amazing. I've been getting some really great feedback from some of you about how this series has helped you be a better follower of Jesus. And that is all that I want. Honestly, my goal with this is that I would help you fall in love with Jesus more. And what better way to do that than a Wednesday night in front of a roaring fire? Can you hear it roaring? It's it's roaring because it's a real fire, it's super warm. It's, it's, it's actually on my laptop, so it's not a real fire. But regardless, it's here and it's setting the atmosphere for us to fall deeper in love with Jesus. I'm really excited for tonight. Uh, let me pray for us and then we're going to dive right in. Jesus, we love you. We ask, Lord, that you would teach us through your word about who you are tonight, about what your intentions are for us, about what you have said about us, about what you are doing for us, Lord. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for these students, Lord, and thank you that you died for us. That is the gospel. You died for us, but you did not stay dead. You rose again so that we could rise again with you in life for eternity. We love you, Jesus. We praise things in your name. Amen. This is cracking a little loud. You may not be able to hear it, but I can hear it. So I turned it down because that's what you can do with the digital fire. You can turn it down. Romans chapter 8, verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God. Who is indeed interceding for us. Who indeed is interceding for us. This is, as many biblical scholars refer to it as, the crescendo of Romans chapter 8. That this is Paul's exclamation point at the end of this portion of his letter. Now it's important to remember about the Pauline epistles, about the, the letters of Paul, is that, and in fact all of scripture, that chapters and verses were not part of, of the original manuscript. So the fact that we have chapters and verses in our Bible is not something that Paul, when he was done with a thought, would write a one next to it, and then a two next to it, and then three next to it. That was actually added in more modern times to make it easier to memorize and refer to scripture. And so he is not being like, okay, this is the end of the chapter, but he's been going on in Romans chapter 8 about the life in the spirit and what it means to have no condemnation in Christ Jesus. And he gets to the end of this portion of his letter, and this is the exclamation point. This is the crescendo. This is the beautiful melody that pours out of the words that he has written. This is... One of the most important things that we can read in Romans chapter 8. Now obviously all of it is God-breathed. All of it is inspired and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. But nonetheless, this is maybe even his thesis. This is the point why he is writing this portion of his letter is because of verses 31 through 34. He is making a very, very, very important part. Now, we have covered two other topics. We've covered, in the first week of Behind the Curtains, the mortification of sin. If you don't remember or if you missed that, the mortification of sin is simply the death of sin or the killing of sin. We talked about what it means to actually be killing sin in your life. That was, perhaps, one of the more important things that we can learn during quarantine. As, Like I said, I gave you the challenge to look yourself in the mirror and decide which sin you were going to be killing. And then last week we talked about suffering. Last week we talked about why does God allow suffering to happen? Why is it that God allows his people to suffer. And I said there are five reasons, and I only told you one of them. The other four will have to come once we can gather in person again. But the one reason we talked about last week was revelation. 
not revelation, literally seeing Jesus or like the, the revelation that John received in, in the book of Revelation, but rather revelation of the impact of the fall. That no one wakes up in the morning and the first thing they think is, man, I am so selfish. I hate my sin. I hate the fall. But when you are struck with a bodily ailment, a bodily suffering, when something happens in your life where you begin to suffer, we begin to understand the impact of the fall of humankind. And so God uses suffering to bring about revelation. Doesn't mean he likes suffering, doesn't mean he enjoys suffering, but it means he uses it when it happens. So we've covered two huge theological topics, and tonight we are going to cover one that might be the biggest theological topic that we've covered so far over the past three weeks, and that is this thing called justification. Justification. You'll see it on the screen. Justification. Justification is one of the more discussed, argued about, debated theological topics. In my opinion, it is pretty simple. And honestly, I call Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 34, Justification 101. So if you're taking notes and you want to title this message, you can simply call it Justification 101. Now, justification is actually a legal term. So when you are just, it means you are determined to be not guilty. If you are not just, you are determined to be guilty. And so the theological discussion topic of justification is the topic and discussion of this. Are you guilty? Are you guilty? And Paul, in verse 31, he starts it with this. What then shall we say to these things, to everything we just read? So when he says this, what then shall we say to these things? It's literally verses 1 through 30. What should we say in light of all of this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? It says in 33, verse 33, who shall bring any charge against God's elect, God's people, God's chosen people, the church? And so he says, if God is for us, who can be against us? He did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? So he is saying, hey, God, the all-powerful, the creator God, the perfect God, the one who sent his one and only son to die for us just so that we may be in relationship with him. This God who has given up his son so that you can know him. If he has done these things, who in the world could ever bring a charge against you? What court? Could determine you to be guilty to your sin. What judge could be could determine you to be guilty to your sin? And he says, it is God who justifies. It is God who determines whether or not you are just. It is God who says guilty or not guilty because of your sin. So a good way to think about this is imagine the different levels of the court. So all of you had to take a, a, a U.S. history class or a civics class at some point if you're in high school. Some of you will take a push. Some of you will take even more advanced history classes where you learn about the history of, of the courts and the court system and, and the, the justice system and all these things. But really, 101 base level, there are different levels of the court. So I'll put it this way. You have the county court. You have the state court. You have the federal court. And then you have the Supreme Court. What Paul is saying here is who then can bring any charge against God's elect? You know, the county might say you are guilty. The state might say you are guilty. The federal might say you are guilty. But the Supreme Court, the highest of the courts, the one who stands in the most pinnacle, important, perfect Whatever you might want to say about God as a judge who sits on that chair, on that court, he is the one who determines you to be not guilty. So no matter what everyone else in the justice system says, you are indeed not guilty. The one most powerful judge in the whole entire universe says justified. And that, my friends, is justification 101. It's that simple. 
Yes, people argue about it. Yes, people like to discuss when are you justified? How are you justified? But what is most important, I will tell you this, is that God justifies you. God, no matter your sin, no matter what you've done, when you believe in him, instantaneously determines you to be not guilty. Your debt has been paid. Jesus died so that you may be instantaneously justified in him as soon as you believe. As soon as you believe. Not after you work hard enough, not after you do X, Y, or Z, not after you memorize enough scripture, but as soon as you believe, you are perfectly and completely justified in Christ. God, the Supreme Court, the Supreme Judge looks at you and says, not guilty because of what Christ did. And that is justification 101. So Paul, in this, these um, four verses of scripture, asks two questions. The first one we just covered. It was, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? And he essentially says, no one. None of it will stick. No matter what people say, it's not going to stick. Because the ultimate judge has already determined you to be not guilty. And then he asks a second question in verse 34. And this is where we're going to sit for the remainder of our time together tonight. He says, who is to condemn? It's the second question. So who is to condemn God's people? Who is to condemn the elect? Who is to condemn the church? And then he says this, Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us, who indeed is interceding for us. He says, no one can condemn. How do we know that? Because in uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 1, it says this, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Continuing on to verse 2, For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. And so Paul asks, Who is there to condemn? And he says, No one. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And more than that, Because he picks back up in verse 34, more than that, who was raised, or excuse me, Christ Jesus is the one who died, and more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Now, the the, the way in which we have to think about this, right, is if you are the enemy of someone, and, 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 and you go to war with them and you kill them. You're going to look at their dead body and say, you have been condemned by me. I am victorious. And so the enemy, when he struck down Christ, said, Christ is dead. I win. I am victorious. But the fact that Christ rose back to life meant that that condemnation was not valid. That the enemy did not condemn Christ, but Christ condemned the enemy. And because Christ did condemned the enemy, it means that there is now no condemnation for us. Because Christ died and Christ rose again. He is now at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. And so there are four things that Christ is doing that we see in here. The first one is that he died. And these are the four reasons why we are not condemned. The first one is that Christ died. The second one is that Christ was raised. The third one is that Christ sits at the right hand of God. That is the place of the utmost power. In the ancient world, and even still today in many cultures, the right hand is the hand of blessing. So this is saying that Christ sits at the blessed right hand of God. That Christ is in the place of the utmost power. So we are not condemned because Christ died, Christ raised, and the one who died and was raised for us now sits in the place of the utmost power. And what is he doing there? Number four, it says he's interceding for us. Now, what does that mean? Intercession is essentially praying for someone. It means you're praying for someone. You might ask, how is Jesus praying for me? And to that, I, I answer John chapter 17, verse 9 
and then 15 through 17. John chapter 17, verse 9 says this, and this is Jesus saying, talking about us. He says, I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. So if you go back to Romans chapter 8, because we're going to start jumping around now, Paul says this in verse 33, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? And you might ask the question, who's God's elect? God's elect in John chapter 17, verse 9 is the them. So I am praying for my elect. I am not praying for the world. So Christ does not pray for the whole world, but rather only for those whom he has been given, his elect. Christ prays for his elect. Circle verse 9 and then write in bold or or whatever highlight or whatever it might be, write us, because that is us. And he continues in verse 14. Or actually in verse 15, I take that back. In verse 15, he says, I do not ask, this is Christ talking to the Father, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And so Christ says he prays for us, and we ask the question, what does he pray for us for? He prays for us, not that we would be removed from this culture, not that we would be removed from the world, because we are not of this world, but that we would be sanctified in the truth, and your word is truth. And so Christ is literally praying for you that you would read your Bibles. I think that's crazy. That Christ thousands of years ago said, Father, you have given them my words. Would they read these words? Would they know these words so that they would be sanctified? And so a lot of you, as you hear that Christ is praying for you, you think that's great. And then you're like, Christ, help me grow in you, blah, blah, blah. But you're not reading your Bible. You see, Christ is literally in heaven praying for you, saying, Father, would they read their scripture? So if you want to grow spiritually, read your darn Bibles. And the other portion of scripture I want to go to is in Luke chapter something. Let me find it. I forgot to mark it. I believe it's 23. No, it's 22. Luke chapter 22, verse 31 and 32. This is, I think, astonishing. When we ask the question, what does it mean that Christ is interceding for us like Paul says? So if we go back here as a quick reminder, in verse 34 of of Romans chapter 8, Paul says, Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, and who is indeed interceding for us. What does it mean that he intercedes for us? Well, in Luke chapter 22, verse 31, this is before Peter denies Jesus three times. This isn't after Jesus denies Peter. This is before Jesus, or excuse me, before Peter denies Jesus. This is, wow, I got tongue twisted. This isn't after Peter denies Jesus. This is before Peter denies Jesus. And this is Jesus talking to Peter. Simon, Simon, which is another name for Peter in scripture. Behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you, that your faith may not fail. That his faith may not fail utterly, is what's being communicated here. That it wouldn't utterly fail. That like everyone else, there are moments where our faith is tested. There are moments where we have a difficult time understanding. But that his faith would not fail utterly. That he would not walk away from the salvation that he has received, walk away from the presence of God that he will be given, that he will not walk away from the revelation of who Christ is that he has known, that his faith may not fail utterly. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. He says, and when you have turned, it's not if, See, Christ in his perfect sovereignty, his perfect knowledge of the future knew that Christ or that Peter was going to deny him. 
And, and he doesn't say, Peter, I have prayed for you that when you receive an opportunity to deny me as I'm dying for your sins, that you wouldn't deny me. But rather he says that when you have turned, when you, when you momentarily have a lapse of faith, that it would strengthen your brothers. That he would use it to strengthen the faith of his brothers. And so we know that Christ is interceding for us in perfect sovereignty. That years ago, before COVID-19, Christ was already interceding on our behalf. That the church would continue to meet. That you would continue to fall in love with him. That is what Christ's intercession is. That Jesus, the Son of God, is praying for you in heaven. And so Paul asks two questions in Romans chapter 8, and I hope you've been able to track because this is a lot. He asks two questions in Romans chapter 8. He says, who shall bring any charges against God's elect? No one. And who shall condemn God's elect? No one. And that is the life that we get to live, friends. A life knowing that we have been justified. And a life knowing that because Christ died, because Christ rose, because Christ sits at the right hand of God, and because Christ justifies us and intercedes for us, we are no longer condemned. I love all of you. Enjoy small groups. All right. Thanks for coming, guys. Thanks, Maddie V, for speaking the good word. I don't know why I keep doing finger guns today. Maybe it's because I've just been by myself a lot. Finger guns are coming back. They're getting cool again. Nope, they're not. That's not true. Don't do finger guns. Go to small groups, guys. If you don't know what small group you're in, you can email us. Our emails will be on the next page, and we will get it figured out for you so you can go to small groups. Uh, we love you guys. And we'll see you next week. Yeah, I got ends in my pants, so I dance like I'm crazy. Right, hit the left, now go crazy. Won't hop too hard, make it wavy. Jesus, my Lord, yeah, he saved me. Uh, slide it, bust down, riot. Fold my hands together, I pray when I'm quiet. Two piece to my enemies, you know they stay silent. Throw it, catch it. Uh, I thought I'd catch it. Little